Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about the cardinal veins and how they form the mature blood drainage system of the body. So we're going to start off with something that looks nothing like anything we've seen in human anatomy. This flying spaghetti monster looking amalgam here is a little representation of the early venous system. You have an anterior cardinal vein which drains the uh, area of the head or the cephalad portion of the embryo and the posterior cardinal vein draining its inferior or caudad region. Both of these converge to form a common cardinal vein and we've got all of this happening on the right and left. Now both of these guys converge into a sac called the sinus venosus and the sinus venosus is a portion of the early embryologic heart. That's a topic I hope to take on in a subsequent video. From here the sinus venosus would actually move the blood into the primitive atrium but since we had to stop somewhere, I sliced off the atrium, leaving us this sinus venosus right here. A couple other veins on each side are draining in. We have the umbilical veins coming from the placenta, at least early on there's two, and the vitiline veins, which are draining blood from the yolk sac. So vitiline vein equals yolk sac drainage, whereas umbilical veins are connected to the placenta. And a lot of what we're going to see involves permutations and changes in the size of these guys from right to left. From here on out, we're going to color coordinate things a bit. So we'll have the anterior and posterior cardinal veins, as well as the common cardinal veins in blue, the umbilical veins in pink, and the vitiline veins in this kind of reddish orange right here. So let's talk about how we go from this weird looking creature to the mature venous system. Now this picture, I've taken what we were seeing before, and I've put it in a little bit broader context. Here we've got the gut tube, We've got the placenta. You'll notice the left and right umbilical veins are connected to it and bringing blood back to the sinus venosus. We also have the yolk sac, which is an extension off of the midgut, so we've got it connected to the gut tube right here. And the vitiline veins heading back to the sinus venosus from the yolk sac. What I want you to note here is we have connections, anastomoses between the right and left vitiline veins. Some pass anterior or posterior to the gut tube and then there's an anastomosis that's occurring in this area just before we get to the heart. That's going to become very important in just a bit. We move a little further along and the, the yolk sac has started to dwindle and in fact in subsequent illustrations it's going to disappear. However the vitiline veins are draining blood from the gut tube and they're going to be important in forming the tributaries of the hepatic portal vein where blood from the gut tube ends up in the mature kind of arrangement. So first thing I want you to note is here the umbilical arteries are losing their connection to the sinus venosus and instead they formed an anastomotic channel with that anastomosis of the vitiline veins right here. What's going on is that they are going to share a common drainage into the right hepatocardiac channel and the left hepatocardiac channel. and Cardiac makes sense, we're heading back towards the heart, but what's that hepato about? Well, well, anytime you see hepato, means we're talking about the liver, and in fact, the liver is developing in this region right here. So this anastomosis of the vitiline veins meeting up with the tributaries of the umbilical veins is actually going to form the blood vessels within the liver that drain back towards the inferior vena cava and then the heart. And we're going to see how that proceeds as we go a little further along. Now right here, what's happened is we've started to have the right umbilical vein dwindle. It's going to get smaller and smaller, whereas the left umbilical vein takes on almost all the blood drainage of the placenta, and it's going to route itself through these sinusoids that are developing from the vitiline veins. Keep in mind, the liver is hanging out in this entire area, and this blood is traveling through it but there's a large channel that develops that shunts the blood from the left umbilical vein across to the right hepatocardiac channel and then to the sinus venosus as the ductus venosus which is going to be allowing blood to bypass the liver not pass through its sinusoids before it gets to the heart meaning that oxygenated blood from the placenta has a relatively straight shot to the heart and doesn't have to work its way through the liver these sinusoids that are developing in here however are going to form the right and left hepatic veins and they're all going to drain to the inferior vena cava which is simultaneously developing here. We're going to cover it a little bit more in a later section. 
Now what's going to happen in the rest of the venous development is that we've already talked about the umbilical vein dwindling on the right. The left hepatocardiac channel here is also going to go away. And what's really strange is that the vitiline veins fairly proximally are going to degenerate on the left side, but more distally are going to degenerate on the right side, meaning that the vitiline vein is going to adopt a relatively tortuous S-shaped course around the back of and then the front of the developing midgut. And now, those of you who've had an anatomy class will actually be able to identify quite a few of these things that have developed out of this process. We've got the umbilical vein taking relatively well oxygenated blood from the placenta to the liver, bypassing it through the ductus venosus to reach the inferior vena cava. Around about the same time, we're going to be having those vitiline veins form the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein converge to make the hepatic portal vein. These are all remnants of the vitiline veins and you'll notice that the mature anatomy has been developed in this way in that the duodenum, its first part passes anterior to the portal vein, however its third portion passes posterior to the superior mesenteric vein and the artery of the same name. Up here are those right and left hepatic veins, which are also dumping into the inferior vena cava from the liver. So all the blood from the gut winds up in the hepatic portal vein, gets taken to the liver, sinusoids allow it to access the hepatocytes, drains to central veins, and then larger and larger hepatic veins until it goes to the inferior vena cava. And that is formation of how the umbilical and vitiline veins contribute to the mature venous system. Now we'll take a step back and take a look at what we've seen before, the anterior and posterior cardinal veins feeding into the common cardinal vein, and how the rest of the body's venous system tends to develop. Now note, the common cardinal veins on both sides drain to the sinus venosus, as do our buddies, the umbilical in pink and the vitilines in orange. So we're going to kind of consolidate these guys as we go forward. A couple other things I want you to note is that here at the end of the posterior cardinal veins near the developing pelvis we have what's called the iliac anastomosis of the posterior cardinal veins. This is an important connection that's going to come into play in the formation of the mature venous system. So as we move along I'm going to summarize all the stuff we talked about on the previous section just by putting a little bit of the inferior vena cava there. So the hepatic segment of the inferior vena cava formed mostly from those vitiline veins and I'm going to take that as red as the rest of these permutations happen, keeping in mind that the changes that brought the umbilical and vitiline veins together happened simultaneously with the changes I'm about to describe. All right, so let's get moving. The first thing that happens is that we have a series of veins develop that's a little more anterior, closer to the belly than the posterior cardinal veins, and these are called subcardinal veins, and they form a significant anastomotic kind of network from left to right called the subcardinal anastomosis. And you can see that they're connected through multiple channels to the posterior cardinal vein here in blue on each side. One thing that the posterior cardinal vein is important for is it's the blood supply to the second or mesonephric kidney. Mesonephric kidney actually becomes a functional kidney for a period of time during mammalian development but then rescinds and you'll notice that the posterior cardinal vein is also going to be going away as we progress because without a mesonephric kidney it doesn't have much of a raison d'etre or reason for being there. Now we've added something that makes it look more complicated but no big deal. Here in red are the subcardinal veins and the subcardinal astenosis, posterior cardinal veins in blue and we've added another set of veins that have developed closer to the back or posteriorly. These are the supracardinal veins on the left and right in yellow and they connect to the posterior cardinal veins and very importantly also with the subcardinal veins and that connection goes by the ridiculous name of the sub supracardinal anastomosis. So the name makes sense if you think about what it's actually telling you but just looking at that word at first is enough to make your head explode at least if you're like me. From here on out, the red subcardinals and the yellow supracardinal veins are going to be taking on a more prominent role and the posterior cardinal vein is going to start disappearing. And that's what's happening right here. 
Those are disappearing on both sides. Simultaneously, we develop an anastomotic channel way up here between the two anterior cardinal veins on the right and the left. This will be important as we proceed a little bit further. We have another right to left developing anastomosis between the supra cardinal veins. It'll also be important. So we've got a couple anastomoses developing in addition to the existing iliac anastomosis and the sub supracardinal anastomosis shown here in green. Now, the main thing that's happening on this slide is that we've got the posterior cardinal veins pretty much disappearing and they won't be shown subsequently except for some small bits down here towards the in the pelvis and the developing lower limbs. But I also want you to note that we've developed a connection between the subcardinal veins and the inferior vena cava. This is going to actually help create another portion of the inferior vena cava as we lose a little bit of the connection that it had to the posterior cardinal vein. Meanwhile, the mesonephric kidney has gone away, but we've got the metanephric kidney. Develops low and ascends, and its major blood supply will turn out to be this sub supracardinal anastomosis in green. So I'm not going to show the kidneys from here on out, other than I want you to note that they're going to be in close proximity to these green vessels, the sub supracardinal anastomoses, because those will have a lot to do with the renal veins of the adult. Not coincidentally, we have the gonads developing roughly the same time. And they're going to get their blood supply from a portion of the subcardinal veins right here. And you're going to see that represented even if I don't have the gonads shown subsequently. Okay, so we pull those out. Let's see what happens if we take this a little bit further. We've lost the posterior cardinal veins almost entirely, except for a little bit maybe hanging out right here and the contributions that they made to the lower limbs and this iliac anastomosis of the posterior cardinal veins. Now, we have anastomotic channels that have formed that are going to get larger, and some of the vessels that we started with are going to get smaller. For instance, the proximal portion of the left anterior cardinal vein is going to constrict and eventually go away. Likewise, the connection between the subcardinal veins and the posterior cardinal vein and the supracardinal vein that was coming off of it constricts. Same time, this cranial portion or more superior portion of the left supracardinal vein constricts and less blood is flowing through here and it has to shunt from left to right as blood drainage occurs. Those of you who've taken anatomy and know the venous system pretty well are probably looking at this and thinking it's starting to look a little bit familiar. And you're right, we're developing the mature circulation. Simultaneously, the connection between the posterior, uh, pardon me, the supracardinal veins and the sub-supracardinal anastomosis, it degenerates proximally, but it stays distally or caudally right here. So that constricts and on the left, the constriction occurs between the sub-supracardinal anastomosis and the supracardinal vein right here. Now, one way to keep this relatively straight in your mind is to think that everything on the left tends to get constricted, and on the right, the only one you have to really keep track of is that the supracardinal vein on the right gets constricted and separates from itself cranial to this sub supracardinal anastomosis in green. I know that's a lot to swallow. Keep on repeating it until it makes some kind of sense. Now, let's remove these constricted and degenerating vessels. And now we have something that looks a heck of a lot like the mature circulation. In blue, close to the head, we've got the right brachiocephalic vein and left brachiocephalic vein developed from the anterior cardinal vein. We have the coronary sinus. Now, this is important for a moment. The coronary sinus comes from the common cardinal vein on the left and drains blood from the heart to the right atrium. Now that's important for just some little malformations we're going to see in a minute. Now the azygous vein is largely from the supracardinal veins on the right side draining into the superior vena cava right there. And on the left side you have remnants of that supracardinal vein forming the hemiazygous and more cranially, the accessory hemiozygous. Occasionally, the accessory hemiozygous will actually drain all the way up here to the anterior cardinal veins. If you've 
followed it a little bit, you'll see how that's possible. But most of the blood tends to pass the midline to the azygous vein and then to the inferior vena, pardon me, superior vena cava right there. The right and left renal veins come at least partially from the green sub supra cardinal anastomosis. On the right side, the right renal vein as well as part of the inferior vena cava are coming from that segment, whereas on the left, it's, cons it's relegated pretty strictly to the distal renal vein. The right and left gonadal veins come from the subcardinal anastomosis, that's why they're in red, as do the suprarenal veins. I haven't actually bothered to label these, but the adrenal glands, adrenal veins, or suprarenal veins are draining to this same area. Now, the inferior vena cava, you can notice here, is made up of a lot of different things. The vitiline veins contributed that hepatic segment. We've got the subcardinal anastomosis. We've got the sub-supracardinal anastomosis. And we've got the supracardinal vein, all contributing to the inferior vena cava. So it's a pretty complicated structure. And finally, we've got the right and left common iliac veins, which have extended off of that iliac anastomosis that formed between the posterior cardinal veins. All right, now I promised there would be a payoff for knowing that the left common cardinal vein formed the coronary sinus of the heart, which drains blood from the heart itself into the right atrium, and that payoff is this. Occasionally, instead of having this segment of the left anterior cardinal vein degenerate, you can wind up with that cardinal anastomosis between the right and the left anterior cardinal veins constrict or not form properly in the first place, which means the blood from the left upper limb and head and neck has to travel through this channel. So this channel, which normally degenerates, does not, and you wind up with, pardon my really funky little rock heart here, but you wind up with the left veins, the left brachiocephalic vein draining to the coronary sinus and then to the right atrium, whereas on the right side, the right brachiocephalic vein is taking blood down where the superior vena cava would have been to the right atrium. Another thing that can happen is instead of constriction there, you can have inappropriate constriction happen here at the right common cardinal vein. Now when that happens, the blood can't get into the heart from the right side, and so it has to backtrack the opposite over here through this channel into the coronary sinus, and you wind up with this all the blood from the upper limbs and the head traveling through the brachiocephalic veins to a weird alternate left-sided superior vena cava that goes to the coronary sinus and then to the right atrium. Or if you prefer to look at this as the worst drawing of a deer's head with antlers ever, I'd forgive you for that too. Couple more. Occasionally, the connection between the hepatic segment from the vitiline veins and the subcardinal anastomosis can form inappropriately and not actually connect. When that happens, this area won't allow the blood from the inferior vena cava here into this more proximal segment, and it has to reroute. And how it reroutes is to go through the branches of the sub, uh, pardon me, the supra cardinal veins, and you wind up with this. Normal looking veins, except all the blood from the lower limbs and the abdominal uh, organs like the kidney and suprarenal veins, gonads, will drain to the azygous vein, then to the superior vena cava, and then to the heart. Meanwhile, this hepatic segment is receiving blood from the portal veins, so all the digestive organs, the stomach, the liver itself, the pancreas, the spleen, small and large intestines, is draining to the liver, but it's completely disconnected from the rest of the inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava, in this case, only carries blood from the gut or the, and its associated glands. And the rest of the lower limbs and retroperineal organs drains through the azygous system. And last but not least, you can occasionally have the anastomosis between the posterior cardinal veins here in the iliac region constrict, not form properly, in which case the left lower limb has to have blood get back to the heart somehow, so it keeps this left side of the supracardinal vein open, and you wind up with a duplicated inferior vena cava. So you have an inferior vena cava on the left draining into the renal vein, and you have it on the right in its more or less normal position, 
and they join at the point where the left renal vein joins the inferior vena cava. And you can occasionally have a little connection here marking the site of that iliac anastomosis, but sometimes nothing at all. I hope this has been helpful and have a great day.